going to be recording our session today so we can post it on the University of Illinois Extension website. And it is my pleasure to be here this afternoon serving as your moderator and somewhat co-presenter for the first session of the Discover Wellness While at Home series. Uh, we hope that you all are staying well. We are so glad that you can virtually join us for this informative series. We think we have a really great lineup for you uh, featuring some of our most requested University of Illinois Extension programs. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to formally introduce myself as well as um, let our presenter introduce herself. My name is Carla Belzer and I am a family life educator with the University of Illinois Extension um, up in Carolee and Whiteside counties. And we'll show you in a minute um, where that is in the state of Illinois, in case you're not familiar with Illinois. And I am Tessa Hobbs Curley. I am a family life educator as well, and I serve in Donna, Knox, Henderson, and Warren County. So this is just a little map of uh, the state of Illinois. If you're not familiar with Illinois, we do have people joining us today from really all over the country, and we are thrilled, especially in this time uh, that we're all currently experiencing that you are joining us to get some well needed information to take care of yourself and really to thrive during this time. So the family life team for the University of Illinois Extension currently consists of five educators in various parts of the state. So you can see myself, uh, Carla Belzer, I'm up in the northwest corner of the state of Illinois and Tessa is down a little bit further south than me, but still West Central Illinois. So with that, I'm just gonna remind everyone, if you could please make sure that your microphones are muted uh, during the call, that would be great. Um, also, please refrain from using your videos. While we'd love to see everyone's smiling faces and connect with you virtually uh, in that way with uh, over 200 people on the call, um, we would overload your screen <laughs> with video screens and we'd rather you see the content. Also at any time, should you have any questions, I'm going to be serving as the moderator uh, for the, the information today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to pop those up in the chat box and I will be glad uh, to address them with Tessa and we can uh, you know, resolve your, resolve your question or answer your question in a timely manner. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tessa. Thanks, Carla. So we're gonna just jump right in. Um, our very first webinar is titled, How High Do You Bounce? And it's about building your resiliency. So individuals, families, organizations, and society go through many trying times, right? <laughs> how we manage those challenges and changes indicate how resilient we are. And you can see on this slide, um, we're referencing a video that you can take a look at a little bit later but it really does illustrate um, how you know, resilient individuals can be and how we can really handle and overcome adversity. Um, here, um, if you know me, I love quotes, and um, resiliency refers to the ability to adapt, recover, and grow stronger from adverse situations. So if you've ever had a broken bone, um, you know that they kind of grow stronger at the break. Or if you think of a rubber band, in order to stay strong during trying times, we must be able to stretch ourselves and even spring forward a little bit. Um, and the good news is that resiliency can be learned and strengthened. Robert Brooks of Harvard Medical School calls resiliency ordinary magic. I love that, ordinary magic, because everyone has the capacity to be more resilient, and there are things that can be done to nurture or reward um, resiliency. Um, <laughs> this is just kind of a cute one. Um, you know, think of a family or person that you know who has dealt well with adverse or um, crisis. What traits does this family or person have? What strengths have you observed? So I'm asking you, what strengths have you ob observed in this person who has really kind of exhibited some of those traits? And if you don't mind, in the chat box, go ahead and um, put some of those traits that you have observed. And Tessa, I, I also just want to add, uh, since we're currently living through a time of adversity, where many of us are being 
um, kind of pushed outside of our comfort zones and things have changed. Um, you know, think about even what you're seeing right now around you of how people are being resilient during this time. And our chat box is zoom yeah. in with all these answers. So, and I love it. Exactly. I see a lot of confidence, kindness, looking out for others, um, that positive attitude, the grace. Absolutely. Um, that inner strength, right? And a lot of support from others. Um, and a key thing there that I noticed somebody talked about that adaptability and being persistent, all of those things. And we're really going to kind of um, highlight that throughout this training today. Mm -hmm. So in the face of adversity and challenges, what keeps you afloat? Just kind of think about that. What keeps you afloat? What keeps your head above water? So again, the title, so how high do you bounce? So we're going to be looking at some research and what it says makes people and organizations um, resilient. So um, in researching resiliency and resiliency in the workplace, several characteristics were mentioned repetitively in the literature. So today we will be re referencing these traits that were most commonly found and a lot of them what you just mentioned um, on our little um, chat. Also, we will identify ways that resiliency can be built in ourselves and also organizations and sometimes with students as well. So when faced with adversity, resilient people are able to reframe the situation and, feel diff and view difficulties as challenges and opportunities for growth. And I think, uh, Carla, kind of what you referred to before is that's a key part is opportunity for growth. You know, every crisis offers an opportunity to grow stronger and wiser. They view challenge um, as manageable and not permanent. And I think that's a really important point even today is that it's not permanent. And they actually feel adversity paves the way for opportunity. So if we think of back in 1920s, um, here's an example. The Ford Motor Company used a lot of timber for the cars. And a lot of waste was generated like the stumps, branches, and sawdust. So the group kind of pondered what they could do with all the waste. So, you know, I can ask, what do you think they ended up doing with it? Well, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. So they found a way to create charcoal forgets from the waste and created a whole new business called Kingston Ford Charcoal. They also learn from the mistakes and failures, but they don't see them as failures. And I think that's a really key is that they don't see them as failures. They see them as an important lesson being taught and to try to find the lesson in every situation. Um, they have confidence in themselves and they believe this belief enables them to take risks. So that's an important point too, is that, you know, they're not just stagnant and things, but they're willing to take some risk um, and not always play it safe. So here we have three pictures. And the top left is Steven Spielberg. Um, did you know that he was rejected from USC Southern California twice? One of the most prolific filmmakers of all time. The man who brought us Schindler's List, Jaws, E.T., or Jurassic Park. You know, he couldn't even get into the film school of his choice. In the end, though, Spielberg would get the last laugh when USC awarded him an honorary degree in 1994. Two years later, he became a trustee of the university. And the one key thing I love about this story is the fact that when we talk about resilient people, they're not holding grudges. They're not um, holding on to things that they didn't or wasn't able to achieve, but he was willing to return to the school that had rejected him and that he, you know, received an honorary degree, but then he also continued to be a part of the university. And I love that um, about him. Stephen King's first novel was rejected 30 times. And if it wasn't for um, King's wife, um, the movie Carrie may not have ever been um, existed. After being consistently rejected by publishing um, houses, King gave up and threw his first book in the trash. His wife, Tabitha, retrieved the manuscript and urged King to finish it. Now King's book have sold over 350 million copies and have been made into countless major motion pictures. So here, what I wanted to highlight is the fact that he had and surrounded himself by a really strong support system. 
And again, that's something we will reference as we go forward. And of course, the top right, Abraham Lincoln. And most people know the story with Abraham Lincoln and his um, challenges, but was refused to enter the entry into law school, had three failed businesses, lost nine elections, and his fiance died. He has said, the path was worn and slippery. My foot slipped from under me, knocking the other out of the way. But I recovered and said to myself, it's a slip, not a fall. I think that is perfect. That again, perspective. So on this one, it's about the perspective that you have. So again, we can think of many different people. If, um, Oprah Winfrey, Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, J.K. Rawlings, even Colonel Harold Sanders, they all failed many times before they succeeded. So you can see how resilient people uh, possessing self-confidence can play a major role in overcoming adversity. Mm -hmm. And Tessa, before we move on too, I really want to encourage people to think about those instances in their own life. Yes, we just reviewed some people who are very famous and very well known throughout the world, but chances are you probably have some people very close to you uh, in your life that have overcome great adversities. Uh, think of uh, individuals that might have survived cancer or have um, gone to war. My, my personal example is my grandfather was a World War II prisoner of war. And sometimes when I think about um, the adversities that he faced in his life, that gives me personal strength to face my own adversities and overcome um, those the challenges that I face and build my resiliency muscles. So it's always a good idea not only to reflect upon um, those very well-known people who have uh, great skills and resilience, but also those everyday people that we encounter. And if you look around you right now, given the current state of affairs, if you look hard enough, you will also see those people doing that, that exact thing uh, during this difficult time. All right. And I think, you know, and that's a great time is, you know, maybe individuals, um, it, it's nice, we talk a little bit about journaling and things like that, but recognizing um, those individuals we did before about the traits, but then also about how resilient they are in everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, recognizing the strength that they possess. So thank you, Carla. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's take a little closer look at characteristics, and we have a bunch of them that we are going to share with you. Those with resilience have initiative and are assertive. Um, they, they carve out the parts of the situation that, can con that they can control, okay? They, um, they can't control the events in their lives from happening, but they can't control how they perceive them and how to respond. So that's a key thing is that it's not about having 100% of control about what's happening, but more of the control of, of how they perceive them and how they respond. They address the reality of the situation and deal directly with the problem and what they actually have control over. They um, have um, what somebody has identified as um, realistic positivism. They see the situation as it is while staying positive about the ability to cope and conquer. They are flexible by letting go of the old ways and are open to new ways. Um, they can cope with change and are very adaptable and they can think outside the box. And I know we hear that a lot, but, but they definitely can think outside the box. They are compassionate because they know that when you are, are kind to others, it makes you feel good. So I know somebody had mentioned that doing for others in the chat box. Um, according to the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, compassion creates positive work relationship and increases cooperation and collaboration. So um, normally we would be showing you, uh, okay, my screen's not moving now. Oh, here we go. Um, a video, uh, many people know this person, Ellen um, DeGeneres, and she, she definitely has a good sense of humor. And um, we, if you would go to this link, um, and I know at the end of the presentation, we have it included as well, but Ellen really does do the scenario where she just shows by simply laughing and just laughing how contagious it can be. And I think several of you could probably 
relate um, to how, um, you know, humor really does improve mood, relieves pain, improves immune system, soothes tension, relieves stress. It also allows us to dis distance ourselves a bit from the problem. Um, it helps us have a different perspective. Many of us probably could share a few examples how laughter has helped us improve our mood. Mm -hmm. And Tessa, I, I just wanted to add with that, I want, I want you all to think over the last week or so, or even two weeks, how many times have you laughed really, really good, really deeply? Um, you can share in the chat box if you'd like. Uh, that might be fun to hear how some people are kind of coping uh, with the current uh, state of affairs. But I really want you to think deeply about that because, um, you know, we've all been in situations in our, in our lives where they, you know, they've been troubling or they've been stressful, um, where a good dose of humor has really improved our mood, uh, just as the research that Tessa has cited. Um, so, you know, as much as we can through these difficult times or any difficult times that we face, we can really look for those humor, that those humorous situations. I'm sorry, it's just reading in the chat box. When I get tired, I get hysterical. And that just makes me smile because I think many of us um, might be experiencing uh, that, especially now. I've been more tired than ever lately. Um, but sometimes we have to go look for humor as well. And that's why we included uh, the link to that, that LN video uh, and her take on humor. And I would definitely encourage you to check that out um, when you, uh, you know, after the webinar or even during the webinar, simply because I think you'll really enjoy it. And it really proves as to why humor is a great characteristic of resiliency. So I'm, I'm so encouraged too to see all the information in the chat box of how people are using humor um, to build their resiliency through this troubling time. So great job, everybody. I really am enjoying reading what everybody is writing. <laughs> I know, and it's moving so fast that it's, it's like, I want to take time to read every single one. But, you know, the other thing with this as well is many of them say, um, relying on how, you know, we're kind of approaching this humor with friends and family as well, right? So we're almost kind of getting that group effect, that group benefit um, from keeping things as light as possible. A lot of the work that we do in Extension actually focuses on children and families. Uh, and we know, especially with children um, kind of living through these troubling times, it really is a good idea um, to keep things as light as possible. Um, you know, that can can uh, really make their experience through this difficult time a lot, a lot better. So keep those positive things coming in the chat box. And, you know, in addition to the humor, that creativity, and I have seen a lot of creativity mm. um, in the last few weeks. Um, and I think people have been forced to be a little bit more creative, but, but honestly, people are brilliant with um, some of the things that they have come up with. And this, again, a little quote here, um, the fact of making sure that you have humor in your life. And I just wanted to echo POWs and Holocaust survivors have even attributed their survival um, to humor. And problems and challenges at work can seem like um, boulders, but with a little change in perspective, you can turn those challenging boulders into stepping stones for growth and success. Mm -hmm. And um, again, there's a video um, that we would reference again, and I encourage you to go to it. It's a little girl, and probably a few of you um, have seen her. Her name's Jessica, and she is standing on her sink, and she's going back and forth saying everything that she loves, mm -hmm. and from her hair to her home to everything around it. But again, it's just kind of affirming the importance of having affirmations can help mm -hmm. you challenge or overcome um, self-sabotage. And I think that we can do, do that. And, you know, whether it's intentional or not, but we can really be like, oh, I should have done that better. Or I didn't say that name right or whatever else. But, you know, um, being able to give yourself some positivity is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you can choose um, to use positive affirmations to motivate yourself or encourage positive changes in your life or boost your overall self-esteem. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, oh, and Tessa, sorry. I just wanted to go back and say with that Jessica video, um, 
I really, again, encourage you to watch that. The link is in the resource that we handed out um, because I would challenge each and every one of you to start your day the way she does. Um, as Tessa says, she's standing and looking in the mirror saying, I am awesome. My hair is awesome. I like my house. I like my mom. I like my teachers. I like my school. It's great, great, great. And not many of us start our days with that attitude. At least I know that I don't, right? So the more we can get into the mindset of positive affirmation, the more, again, we're building that resiliency muscle, which I think is really um, kind of crucial, not only given what we're currently going through, but it can benefit us in many um, different areas in our life. Awesome. And again, um, to add, Dr. William James said, it is our attitude at the beginning of a difficult undertaking, which more than anything else will determine its successful outcome. So again, we all know what attitude can do, but people that bounce back are optimistic and practice positive thinking. They don't dwell on the negative. Um, a Gallup poll estimated that there were 22 million negative coworkers or workers in the U.S. costing 300 billion in productivity a year. Negative emotions are associated with increased risk of heart attack and stroke and decreased lifespan and longevity. And that's kind of obvious. But positive people obviously live longer in the in the famous Snowden study of nuns, and I don't know if many of you um, have heard of that, but it's Snowden study of nuns, researchers found that those who regularly express their positive emotions ended up living an average of 10 years longer than those who didn't. So people with regular expressed positive emotions are more resilient than when facing stress, challenges, and adversity. Uh, positive people have more friends, which is a huge factor of happiness and longevity. We really do talk um, in a lot of brain health around socialing, uh, socialization and the importance behind that. Um, positive work environments have also been found to outperform negative work environments. Okay, and I think we have seen um, a lot of different research with that when people are comfortable and the type and the productivity that they can um, get out of work. Um, resilient people have positive energy. Um, according to the energy bus, positive energy and people create positive results. Um, you can look at positive energy like a muscle. Um, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. Um, according to the book, a company's uh, most important asset is energy. That's coming from staff, the energy they bring to their work. So again, we're looking at fine tuning your optimism by mm -hmm. being around positive people that support you, laugh and surround yourself mm -hmm. with things that help relieve stress, P practice, okay, that's a key, practice positive self-talk, and don't worry about the things you have no control over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, and Tessa, I like how it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and go Tessa, ahead. I was just going to say, even though the energy bus focuses on building resilience in the workplace, those many same skills can be transferred to building resilience within our families. So um, just as our families pick up on our energy that, that we put out there, um, you know, so does our workplace. So positive energy in our families can also create positive results. Awesome. So um, highly resilient people tend to appreciate their blessings and practice gratitude. They look at the good in things. Um, again, the author from the Energy Bus, John Gordon says, when the work is piled high on your desk, be thankful you have a job when so many are unemployed. When work is driving you crazy, be thankful that you are healthy enough to work. When you are fighting traffic, be thankful you can drive a car when there are many in the world that have to walk miles just to get clean water. When a restaurant messes up your meal, think about how many people go hungry every day. So I love that, again, perspective. Mm -hmm. It's about counting your blessing, being grateful. So you may want to take time to list your blessings or what you are grateful for to help reduce stress and build a positive outlook. And that's a great thing. And the one thing with it is you don't need a fancy journal or anything else. You can just, you know, use a piece of paper and a pen or pencil and then just write down some of the things you're grateful 
for and be diligent with it, you know, be mindful with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Go ahead, Carla. Yeah, and Tessa, I was just going to add too, um, you know, when we think about what's currently going on in the world and many of us are displaced, Tessa and I are actually joining you from our homes right now. <laughs> um, I don't think we've ever done a joint webinar from our homes. You know, our children are out of school. There's lots of displacement that's going on that it can be easier for us just to focus on all the things that aren't going well correct. Um, it can, you know, we, we kind of work our resiliency muscle a little bit when we are focusing on those things that we are grateful for. And in this current time, you know, there's many different strategies for practicing gratitude. I see someone in the chat box um, is recommending a gratitude journal. Absolutely. I'm going to date myself a little bit, but, um, you know, Oprah often talked about when she had her TV show, she often talked about having, um, writing down every day, the three things things that she was thankful for that day. I think she probably started the gratitude journal, joking a little bit. Um, so yeah, so we all know that this is kind of something that we should be doing, um, but some, you know, sometimes it's a little bit harder to get in the practice of that. And given kind of the trouble sometimes that we're currently walking through, um, you know, when the news changes sometimes hour by hour, sometimes we might have to force ourselves to think about gratitude hour by hour, right? And really focus on the gratitude of the moment rather than, you know, this whole day or this whole week. Um, however, do, do whatever works for you. Um, as Tessa said earlier, we do a lot of work at the University of Illinois Extension in Brain Health, and we talk to people a lot about kind of retraining our brains. Um, and using gratitude really is a mindset shift where we're really trying to uh, focus our brain on, um, you know, the positive. And the idea is the more that we kind of force our brain to do that, uh, the more likely our brain will do that just automatically. It's kind of, it takes practice to perfect, you know, that neural pathway and all of those those big things. So um, again, lots of great ideas uh, in, in the chat box, but I just wanted to expand on that a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm sure that people were fami familiar with gratitude journals, but I also want you to consider, you know, how you're applying gratitude in this current situation. Uh, because whether you've realized it or not, we are currently building our resiliency muscles, right? And I know me, sometimes I'm building that muscle even hour by hour, um, you know, where things are going really good and then I have a setback and then I'm frustrated by this and then there's a positive, you know, so all of those things are building our resilience. And, you know, someday when we walk through the end of, you know, this current situation that we're in, it's my hope that people are more aware of how this current moment in time has made them stronger and more positive. So, um, wow, I really kind of ran with that, didn't I, Tessa? <laughs> no, it's perfect because, yeah. again, I love that one thing is do what works for you uh -huh. and, that, and practice. And I think we've said this many times. It's practice. It's not a matter of doing a one time or whatever else and leaving it. It is a matter of practice. Right. And that kind of leads to that whole um, spiritual. Um, mm -hmm. This can this can, but does not necessarily mean um, in a religious sense, being spiritual means that um, they feel they have a larger value and a bigger purpose than just for themselves. It means a belief in something bigger than ourselves, and it can be a very powerful motivator. And so again, as we're looking at all these characteristic traits, um, that's just something to kind of really keep in mind. And here, um, you know, resilient people take care of themselves, okay? And I'm going to say that again. Take care of themselves. Being kind to oneself is one of the most critical elements to bouncing back and moving ahead. They get enough sleep, they exercise, and they practice stress management techniques. Um, everyone experiences stress, and a little stress can be seen as positive. And, um, and again, it can be a huge motivator. but it if we accumulate stress mm -hmm. and we do not manage it effectively or find an outlet for it, it can become chronic and have negative effects on our minds and bodies. Um, stress makes our bodies produce hormones called cortisol, which in large and ongoing doses have been shown to cause um, depletion of brain um, chemicals and brain cells, lower 
um, immune function and bone density, increased weight gain, blood pressure, cholesterol and heart disease. So I could go on and on, right? So we know the impact of stress. Um, so here I'm gonna ask a question for all of you and go ahead and put it in the chat box. Um, here, what are some healthy ways that you manage or reduce your stress? Mm -hmm. And I fully expect the yawning. <laughs> I love that. So, and also I want you to consider as we're listing all the ways that we're reducing our stress, I want you to also consider, um, you know, bringing again back to the present moment, how good are we doing that right now? Okay. So it can be pretty easy uh, to kind of get wrapped up in everything that's going on. Again, moment by moment, hour by hour, think things can be changing. Um, so now it's even more important than ever to effectively practice good self-care. Um, so some of the strategies that were listed about, um, you know, how we remind ourselves to be grateful, we might have to implement some of those strategies as well to remind ourselves to take care of ourselves. okay? Um, you know, as we're all kind of living through these different times, um, it can be easy for us to, uh, especially if you're working from home, um, you know, it can be easy for us just to kind of, you know, not get up and um, get fully ready for the day or stay in our PJs all day. And if, if that is you, awesome, if that works for you, but sometimes that can be uh, a downfall to our own good self-care. We might not um, be, you know, feeling as good about ourselves. You know, we might be breaking from our routine. So really the point is, is that during, especially during this really challenging time, we need to make self-care a priority into our life. And I love that somebody said a dance break. Um, I've just started a simple routine in my family just within the last week that when we are cooking dinner, um, somebody gets to pick the, um, the uh, soundtrack for cooking dinner in the kitchen and we sing and dance as we uh, cook our meal. And it's pretty funny. It's kind of crazy. It gets really loud, but we are practicing good self-care because we are laughing. We are enjoying each other's company and we're hel it's helping us relieve the stress that we might be experiencing. So find some really creative ways. Um, you know, right now, given everything that we're going through, you know, the traditional ways that you might practice self-care, um, you know, you might not find them as fulfilling as you once did. So really, you know, stretch your creativity muscle and um, find something that's, that works for you and your family. And I love the fact that you said that we need to apply, everybody's able to list some of the things that they're, you know, that they go to, but we really do need to be mindful and follow through with um, doing those activities that were listed. And just keep in mind the stress reducers just need to be something that help us relax or, or is soothing and pleasurable, um, make us feel good and we can build, um, that we can build in our lives on a regular basis. And I think that that's a really important thing that we make it um, something regular that we make sure that we're doing. And so here, um, mindful meditation is the ability to focus one's attention on the present moment, not thinking or worrying about yesterday or tomorrow. Through meditation, we prepare our neutral pathways for resiliency. Um, the research on mindfulness has shown um, mindfulness-based interventions reduce stress and symptoms of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, eating disorders, and chronic pain. Um, meditation and mindfulness training can lower um, cortisol levels and blood pressure and increase immune response. Um, experience, um, um, it definitely has um, the capacity for working memory and decrease in mind wandering. It improves um, emotion. There are many studies um, I could share with you, but I would like to um, share what has been happening at the um, NYU School of Business, which has been implemented in mindfulness training in their overall program. And the idea is to plant the mindfulness seed early at, um, in the MBA students' lives to equip them with tools to positively impact others while taking a more fulfilling and balanced approach to the work. The techniques um, help students to curb multitasking to be comfortable and with 
the uncomfortable. So again, it's being comfortable with the uncomfortable and to become aware of their judgments so that they can see clearly and difference uh, between the truth of a situation and the cloudly, cloudliness of their own projected projections or ideas. Um, again, students self-reported that the program made, made them more self-aware, more focused, and better able to recognize and understand their own thoughts and emotions. I love the fact that they um, invested that in their students. Um, again, we there's many different um, approaches to mindfulness practices and, and meditation and things like that. Um, I am going to have um, Carla walk you through a little mindfulness activity, if you don't mind, Carla. You want to go ahead and do that now? Carla? I was muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, all the wonders of working at home and when children <laughs> and dogs are afoot, um, you mute yourself so you, they are not being heard by the world. So, um, yes, yeah, so I actually was sharing before I unmuted myself that at Extension, we do quite a bit of work uh, with mindfulness in terms of um, helping people use it as a tool to reduce their stress. So there's lots of research out there. Um, as to why this is beneficial. That's a whole nother session actually in the series where we're specifically gonna focus on mindfulness. So I don't wanna give away all of our tips and tricks and tools. Um, and actually, instead of uh, guiding you through a mindful activity right now, I just wanna briefly talk about some different ways that you can incorporate mindfulness very quickly um, into your daily life. And if you already are, if you currently are practicing mindfulness, go ahead and just pop in the chat box and share with us kind of what you're doing and how mindfulness works for you. Um, I'm always a little careful when I say mindful, mindfulness meditation because that word meditation sometimes scares people. Um, you know, they think we might need to sit in a certain way or dress a certain way or be in a certain state. And really mindfulness meditation really is more about focusing on the moment, focusing on what's happening in the moment and um, really paying attention to what's going on in your body, specifically your breathing. Now, certainly there are many, many different scripts and videos and resources and blogs and apps and all sorts of things, um, things that you can access to get more information on mindfulness and how you can practice it. But just a few things that I want to share with you today, some simple, easy practices that you can implement really time, really anytime, anywhere, especially when you're starting to feel stressed out or overwhelmed, uh, which I think you know, many of us are, are trying to deal with um, better uh, these days. So the first thing you can consider doing is anytime you feel that tension rising in yourself um, or around you, you can just simply close your eyes or if you're not comfortable closing your eyes, you can just have a soft gaze either at the floor or at your feet or somewhere up at the ceiling or in the sky and just take three good deep breaths in. And as you're doing those, those deep breaths, really turn your attention to where you feel that breath in your body. Do you feel it uh, in your abdomen, in your tummy? Uh, do you feel that breath moving in and out more so in your chest? Um, it's going to sound kind of odd, but one of my favorite places to kind of focus on where I feel my breath is actually my nose. Um, we breathe all the time, but you, we we very rarely pay attention to the breath moving in and out of our nose and how that feels. Um, so, so that's a, a quick, easy thing that you can do anytime, anywhere. Sometimes when we talk about mindfulness meditation, you know, people think, oh, you know, I need to sit quietly and calm my mind for 20, 25 minutes, um, which for many of us, that is, is a really a tall, uh, a tall task. Um, even I myself, I can get about, you know, five to seven minutes of quieting my mind, and that's about all I can handle. Um, so everyone's kind of at a different spot in terms of um, how they can really quiet their minds and their, and their bodies and focus in on their breathing. But the fact of the matter is, is that we can still try. And every time 
we take a deep breath and we kind of close out those overwhelming thoughts. We close out those thoughts of projection, of things that are coming, or rumination of things that have already happened. Every time we kind of close those out of our mind, we are building that resiliency muscle. So one other or two other um, mindfulness practices that I think you could probably implement and you might find useful um, right now, one that really, really works for me is just to quiet myself wherever I am, whether it's in my home, sometimes I've, I've done this in my office before, it really works great for me if I'm out in nature. Um, I just quiet myself and for a minute or two minutes or however long I think is beneficial, I try to listen for every sound I can hear. So whether that's you know a bird chirping or a lawnmower down the street or the wind through the leaves or my refrigerator humming or the fan on my laptop whirring, I try to pay attention to all of those sounds. In those brief moments, we are giving our brain a break from the stress and a break from the cortisol production, okay? And that can be really, really beneficial. So I lied. Now I actually have two more I want to share with you. Um, so kind of related to that, we could do a, what's called a grounding technique. It's a five senses scan. So we identify five things that we can see. Pretty easy, right? You think, oh, I can see lots of different things right now. But I really want you to focus in on the small little things that you might not otherwise notice. So like a crack in the sidewalk or some paint peeling somewhere or, you know, a little a little mark on the floor. Focus in on those more obscure things. Um, so five things that we can see, four things that we can hear, which is um, exactly like the practice I just mentioned, three things that we can feel. So we think of feeling as only with our hands, but we actually feel with our whole body. So the things that we could feel could be, you know, what do our legs feel like sitting in the chair or connecting with the chair that we're sitting in right now? What do our feet feel like being pulled down to the earth with gravity? Um, you know, what do our feet feel like inside of our shoes in this moment? Or what does our skin feel like when the wind is coming up against it? So three things that we can feel. Uh, two things that we can smell. Now this one sounds a little, a little tricky because some smells are not good smells, um, but really searching the air um, for pleasant and unpleasant smells. And then the last one is the one thing that we can taste. Um, so that could be the current taste in our mouth or if we take a quick sip of something or we chew some gum, um, what is the taste in our mouth? So five things we see, four things um, we hear, three things that we can feel, two things that we can smell, and then one thing that we can taste. The final one I wanna share with you, um, I can guarantee you, you have done it before. So what happens to you when you see a pretty sunrise or sunset? Most often, you don't have to answer in the chat box, but most of us stop whatever we're doing for however long, and we admire it, right? We say, wow, that's a really pretty sunset. And then generally, we whip out our phones and we take a picture and we post it to various social media sites to say, hey, I saw this pretty sunset. That is also an act of mindfulness because in that moment, we are pausing that projection and rumination in our brain and we are engaging in the moment. So look for those opportunities throughout your day, even during those difficult day, these difficult days, to really observe something that's beautiful and something that's special and pay attention to all of the details around it. So hopefully I didn't give away everything we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks at the mindfulness session, but maybe I even intrigued you to come and join that session with us uh, towards the end of April. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Tessa to talk about a few more uh, characteristics we found in research. And I just want to kind of share, we would normally show a video, and somebody already had alluded to it in the chat box about Andy Puttycomb, Puttycomb. and he is an English um, author and public speaker, and he is a co-founder of Headspace, mm -hmm. and he does provide a lot of guided um, meditation training and mindfulness um, for users, and there is a video um, from Jimmy Fallon from The Tonight Show with him um, coming on there and kind of walking through some of that. So great job, um, Carla, kind yeah. of giving additional um, examples of that. Okay, it's not moving forward again. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's also the wonders of, you know, home Wi-Fi and home internet. We're not linked in. There, there we go. <laughs> I'm like, that's great. <laughs> so I agree. Um, when we think about when faced with adversity, resilient people do not feel they have to be, have to struggle on their own. And I think that, see, Carla was with me. She was, you know, we were struggling with this. Um, they know they have other people and support to help them. They feel a sense of belonging and connectedness and have a strong relationship with others. So again, having a social support systems are important to individuals. Research links the um, presence of social support to successful overall psychological well-being. Having social supports contributes to improved cognitive function and memory and also reduces stress and lowers blood pressure. So you've heard me identify that several times. So again, um, some of the character traits that really do help with reducing the stress and lowering blood pressure. There are three types of support, okay? So informational, and that is about giving and getting advice and guidance that will help to change the situation. It could be giving guidance for resources, okay? And then we have emotional. So affirmations, mostly given by family and friends. This gives the confidence needed to take action and remain focused. And then concrete. Um, it could be physical or financial support, a loan, child care, carpooling, ex, you know, et cetera. Um, people who have strong connections at work. Um, so again, I was talking about individuals. So now I'm talking about work. People who have strong connections at work are more resi resistant to stress. Staff members should strive for positive relationships with each other and include models of trust and inclusivity. So again, whenever we think about relationships and the importance of it, but you know, I identify those three types of support, informational, emotional, and concrete. So here is kind of a little activity. So again, as we talk about that social connection, um, this is something that you um, can complete on your own, but um, you can take a look at that self inventory to check how strong your social supports are and if you need to kind of bulk them up a little bit. So this form um, is available electronically. I think Carla had put the link in the little chat box. It's the um, last page of the handout. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And it's also the last page of the handout. Um, <laughs> and here, what we're just asking you to do is that you're looking at your social support with family, friends, and acquaintances. And this is just a nice little guide and resource to kind of take a look at that. Um, and see which ones that you might want to add to. And then also to recognize that you have a lot of people maybe that you didn't, you weren't even thinking about that provide you with um, a lot of support. And here, um, what gets you up in the morning? So in the chat box, what, what kind of gets you up in the morning? What motivates you? And as you're kind of typing in the chat box, I'm just going to continue on. Um, individually and as a part um, of the workplace, there's a strong sense of purpose, goals, and vision. Uh, a resilient team is one in which people have a shared sense of purpose and connectedness. And so we know that about a workplace. Um, resilient organizations have trust and accountability between management and staff, where everyone is committed to action no matter what needs to be done and no matter what uh, their position is. Um, staff and team members can build the shared sense of purpose and connectedness with activities and informal gather gatherings. Um, it is helpful for staff to understand how their work contributes to the vision and purpose. So I know like for me, um, I like in the chat book, you know, talks about the coworkers, coffee, right? Dogs. Again, different things motivate different people. We don't all have to be the same. But mm -hmm. again, we do need to come together um, as an organization or a place that we work to know what our vision and purpose is and mm -hmm. what we all can add to that, mm -hmm. um, that we know that we feel value to it. And Tessa, even though, you know, we talk about workplace in these next couple of slides, all of these things also apply to resilient families as well. The research has shown that these same skills that are valuable in the workplace are also valuable to building resilience in families. So if you're not currently working or if you're retired, um, you know, also think about how these things can apply to your family situation as well. 
Awesome. And here, and I think this applies very well, that good communication, positive communication habits are necessary for resilient relationships. And I'm going to put that word positive. Um, these habits assist in meeting life's challenges, help resolve conflict, and promote loyalty and trust. And here, I don't know how many of you have ever watched the TV show Parks and Recreation. Um, and some probably have and some have not, but we would, and we have identified a link um, at the end of the presentation for you to watch, but it's, it's just a TV show kind of talking about communication and, and it's a comedy um, and it's a, one of those that you can watch for some humor and for some relief there, but it really just shows um, about, you know, how important communication can be. And then again, as we talk about communication, here are some tips. Um, practice active listening. So again, we really do emphasize the fact of listening to what someone is telling you instead of thinking about how you are going to respond. That is really, it does take a lot of practice um, for individuals to do that. Think through what you want to say first. So kind of process in your head, about what you want to say or how you want to respond and how it might sound to somebody else. Make your feelings and wishes known to avoid misunderstanding. Um, it is important that sometimes that you um, repeat or reflect um, upon what you're saying and making sure that you're clear with that. Um, explain your feelings to avoid blaming and shaming others and speak with empathy to communicate respect to those listening. Um, and then again, let them know you're, you understand, um, clarifying. So it is sometimes, you know, whenever we might give some suggestions or recommendations on something, sometimes we just need to have individuals repeat what they heard and get that, um, if they need a clarifying, if we need to be more clear or if we need to clarify something a little bit more for them. So that's just, again, some additional um, effective communication traits. Here, um, staff, that has the ability to control some things at work, like their schedule, clothing, location, environment, are happier and more satisfied. Research has shown that having control over some aspects of work and or the workplace is more important to staff and even more than salary. Being involved in the decision made in the workplace is important by giving input while on committees. Um, they are motivated by flexibility, fairness, opportunities to learn, and for their accomplishments to be acknowledged. And again, authentic connection between supervisors and staff and getting honest feedback and recognition from administration is desired. And again, this is just some traits. And as Carla was mentioning earlier, as we talk about the whole autonomy and involvement opportunities, we can definitely uh, apply that to our daily lives. And then here, um, to just to kind of refocus on resilient people work smarter, not harder. And um, they find a more balanced way to work that will help eliminate spillover and make them more productive. They take breaks to reset your energy and refocus. They try not to multitask. So while multitasking was once um, thought to be positive, um, attribute, it is now starting to become a dirty word. Researchers are starting to find evidence that multitasking leads to lower overall pro productivity and more mistakes. When people are multitasking, um, leads to lower overall productivity and um, that sometimes switching between tasks they have less ability to filter out irrelevant information. So again, as we kind of look at this, um, again, as Carla was walking us through some mindfulness um, kind of lessons, it's really important that we kind of take a look at that again and making sure that we're, not, we're eliminating some time wasters and some interruptions, interruptions with that. Um, here too, um, one of the things, they are able to disengage from work when they are away. So think about that. Um, we are so connected um, through our phones and um, the fact is disengaging from work when they are away or mentally turning off work. According to Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior, Jamie Bruman, it is cr critical for people to completely disengage from work when they are away from the office. 
it is the weekend and all you are thinking about is a project you have to do on Monday. Has anybody ever done that? Um, then you really don't completely benefit from your time off. Um, he suggests turning off your work phone if you have one and resist the temptation to check emails. This takes a lot of discipline, but um, progressive organizations are helping employees protect their downtime. So again, as we look about this overall is making sure that we are away from the screen. You know, limiting your screen time is really important. And so as we look at resilient people that disengage from work, um, disengage from um, going back to that wasteful time. And, um, and again, I think I read, read in here is that it is hard, and I'm not going to pretend like it's easy to disengage from work. Um, we all have probably said at some point that, you know, if I disengage on the weekend or, or while my vacation, I don't check it, I'm going to come back with just a plethora of work and more work. Um, again, it's a balance and we realize that and know what can work for you, mm -hmm. but making sure that there is mm -hmm. a time for disengagement. Right, and I, I wanna address that real quick and, and we might run a few minutes over so if people have to drop off and go to other things, we are technically at the last slide, but don't hang out on it just yet. We got a few other things we just wanna cover real quick, but really to get us through these times when we are working from home, two things are very critical having a routine and setting boundaries and sticking to those boundaries. Um, so, you know, that I, I know we all have different setups right now if you're, if you are working from home, um, but really trying to maintain those boundaries because that is really what's going to enhance your self care um, during this troubling time. So um, my current work from home office is in, in a room in the front of my house that we don't use too often. So I consider myself one of the lucky ones because I don't have to see it all the time. Um, but I have found myself over the last two weeks or so really monitoring, okay, it's eight o'clock at night. I could go into that email real quick or I should, you know, do that work task real quick. But I've really had to take my own initiative and say, no, this is family time or no, this is self-care time and really establishing that boundary. Um, so, you know, trying to distance your space as much as you can. Uh, and if then that's not possible, this is really an opportunity to build kind of that, um, your, your strength in saying no to work and shutting it down. I totally get it. We, I think we've been producing more over the last week and a half in extension than we probably do in an entire month. So I understand that the work is always there and this might be a really pressing time for some of us, but what's best for our self-care and what's best for our resiliency and getting through this difficult time is really to having that good solid routine and boundary. So Absolutely. Tessa, before you um, go to the next slide and our, our closing slide, I just want to kind of encourage people, you know, these are many of the things that you said earlier um, are characteristics of resilient people. And this is what the research has, has shown and what we've talked about today as being characteristics of resilience, resilient people. So I really would encourage you as we walk through the next couple of weeks together, as we walk through the next couple of months and the rest of the year together until things are finally back to normal, whatever that means for us, I really would encourage you to think about this list and really make a mental note of when you see this in action in your life. Okay, when you see those around you that are being compassionate, when you see those around you that are being flexible and adaptive, when you see those around you that are having faith or a positive attitude or are finding the silver lining, um, or those that are being persistent that we're going to make it through this, in a lot of ways that can help bolster our own self resilience and can build our own resiliency muscle just when we notice those things in those around us. So again, here is overall kind of a list of characteristic um, traits of resilient people. And, you know, we kind of... Oh, isn't that crazy? Oh. Uh, you like oh, hang on. I'll handle that like in a second. Okay, hang on, hang on. Where's my participants <laughs> list? <laughs> Somebody unmuted. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh, I think I muted Tessa. <laughs> Tessa, you might need to unmute yourself. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm rattling on. Okay. So again, you, you might ask yourself, so how high do you bounce? You know, what traits or methods have you employed um, at 
your pre, you know current workplace or previous or what you've done in the past. Um, also, let's see my slides not wanting to move forward again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. That's all right. So just well, to close out, because we are a few minutes beyond our, our time as Tessa's is getting that worked out, just sure. remember that we all face adversity. Um, we have a wonderful closing video that's in the resource sheet that we really want you um, to check out of a man who experiences some physical adversity. Um, so when we think about resilient people, they can identify problematic situations. They can handle their emotions. They keep calm and carry on. They're realistic. They trust themselves. They're empathetic. They're all those things that we just listed. And always remember that challenges represent an opportunity for growth. So that's another key to consider during this trying time. What is this teaching you? How are you growing and becoming better and stronger through whatever ever path you're walking right now? And if we keep those things in mind, uh, we can build our own personal resilience. So, and that's exactly what I wanted to echo to is that yeah. we can always build it, period. In that, you know, sometimes things don't work and that's okay. Um, I encourage you always to try it again. And then there's many, just whenever we look at that list of resilient people, there might be, you know, 10 of them that you're really great at. And so just build upon that and give yourself credit for it. Absolutely. So do you want me to close out with just a few final yes. slides there, Tessa? So if, if you want to go ahead and just um, forward that. So we do have, uh, if you're if you're working, <laughs> if the, the slide is working for you. So in your resource book, I've, I've uh, your uh, handout um, that I've put in the chat box several times, I will go ahead and email out that to everyone. I also just put in the chat box a link um, these are the resources. I put uh, in the chat box a link for a survey. It takes literally one minute. That's what Qualtech says. It's a one minute survey. So if you could pop on over to that survey, this is the short link. I, again, I'm going to put the, the direct link into the chat box so you can access that directly. If you could give us some feedback. Um, from today's information, we would greatly appreciate it. We always use that information um, to better our sessions and uh, really hone in on the information that we're teaching. You wanna go to the next slide, please, Tessa? So I just wanted to remind you that if you're not already signed up for it, next week we have a caregiver self-care webinar session on April 2nd, really focusing on the challenges, overcoming the challenges of caregiving. I want people to think very deeply about caregiving, so it's not just taking care of older adults, which many of us are doing, but it's also caregiving for children. I'm a caregiver myself. Um, so during these difficult times, you know, we could use some extra support and extra reinforcement uh, in those areas. And I think we have one more slide. Um, so just some final other resources for you. Um, we have some great healthy living resources on our Illinois extension page. It's go.illinois.edu healthy families. We will leave this um, slide up if you would like to go ahead and write this these resources down. The University of Illinois Extension has also developed some specific resources related to COVID-19, and they are research-informed, fact-based, really, really great resources for you and your family. Um, so I'd encourage you to also go over to that website and, um, and explore some of the th great things that we have for you there. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope that you stay well. Thank you, Chelsea, for putting that in there. <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone. She's, our, she's our, our tech number two today, so thank <laughs> you for that support. Um, we do want to thank everyone for joining us. We hope that you continue to join us uh, for this webinar series, and we hope that you also stay well. Um, so with that, we are just going to um, close out the series or close out the session today. We will leave it open for a while so people can copy down this information. Thank you everyone for all your kind comments and all your funny comments today. Um, we really appreciate your participation.